He was probably the first African leader to be treated by white men as an equal. Now, in his old age, he's practically the incarnation of the history of our time. In Europe, the bloodiest of modern wars was being fought with tanks, machine guns, and poison gas. But here, the centuries rolled back as if to King Henry at Agincourt, or Richard losing his crown at Bosworth Field. Joining the new League of Nations, he put his faith in the latest post-war watchword, collective security. In such great company, one little country would surely be safe, for none would let another gobble it up. Instead, he hoped that all might compete in helping him to modernize his country and make it worthy of its place in the League. To extend his foreign contacts, he toured the European capitals. In London, the Times described his arrival as an historical event. In Stockholm, he met King Gustav, and the Swedes promised him doctors. In Brussels, he found financiers ready to invest in his country. Governors of Africa's colonial territories came to salute the independent African king. Benito Mussolini, the Italian dictator, proclaimed he would create a new Roman Empire, and he aimed at the one place left for imperial conquest in Africa, Haile Selassie's Ethiopia. And Britain and France would do no more than proclaim an embargo on arms sales to both sides. For Italy, with her own arms, the embargo was a green light. For Ethiopia, it was a death sentence. But for Haile Selassie, the final betrayal came at the League of Nations. Pierre Laval, the French foreign minister, and Sir Samuel Hoare for Britain, proposed to hand part of Ethiopia to Mussolini. Appeasement had triumphed. Collective security was a myth. In the war that followed, Haile Selassie had no chance. He did so with a dignity that has become a legend. Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le... The jeers of fascists in the gallery did not stop him. I am here to claim justice, he said. What reply shall I take back to my people? There was no answer, and there could be none. The League was dead. So, said the Emperor, it is us today, it will be you tomorrow. He created a network of tiny airstrips that broke down the isolation of the interior for the first time. When the 1950s opened, Ethiopian airlines were in business. It was Haile Selassie's first major accomplishment in modernizing his country. Ethiopia's past for the first time came to the aid of the present and made Haile Selassie and his capital the focus of Africa's new hopes. As almost the only independent African ruler after the war, Haile Selassie provided a symbol of self-respect for black men just emerging from white rule the wind of change had come to Africa. Recognizing the emperor's unique position, the United Nations chose Addis Ababa as its African headquarters, and he embarked on a new political career. The age in which we live, your imperial majesty, is an age of paradox. In his brand new Africa hall, Haile Selassie presided at innumerable meetings of his new revolutionary colleagues. He became the great African father figure, the great African peacemaker, in the Congo, in Biafra, in Morocco and Algeria. It was a strange apotheosis 
for the King of Kings. He didn't always succeed, but his voice commanded respect because he alone in Africa had been both victim and victor in the struggle against colonial rule. He alone had been the first martyr of the old League of Nations and was now a founder and guide of the new United Nations. Seeing his influence in the new Africa, the world beat a path to his door. The Organization of African Unity followed the United Nations and set up shop in Addis Ababa. Diplomats and businessmen flocked in. Within a decade, the face of Addis Ababa was transformed. The signs of international affluence towered over the old open drains. With the bankers and diplomats came foreign money and foreign aid. There were new ports, new roads, new dams to be opened. America trained the emperor's army. Russia built his schools. Israel provided technicians. India supplied teachers. Britain brought doctors. France offered culture. Germany sent trade missions. Haile Selassie's old empire had become the new African showcase, and everyone wanted an exhibit there. Today, Haile Selassie is besieged by foreign delegations hoping to catch his ear. He balances these contemporary forces to strengthen his own independence as shrewdly as he juggled half a century ago with the rival tribes and princes in his old fight for power. One day, it may be a Japanese delegation. The next day, a mission from Maoist China. It doesn't matter what political persuasion they are, they all see Haile Selassie as an essential link to the rest of Africa. Even with Italy, he's made friends again. On a state visit to Rome, 30 years after Mussolini's troops had been driven from his country. His name is everywhere. His presence seems all pervading. His word seems law. In his old age, it looks as if Haile Selassie has routed all his enemies at last, to emerge supreme, as if the all-wise and benevolent Lion of Judah has prevailed. Nearly half the population of Ethiopia now is under the age of 15, and for Haile Selassie, their education has always been an obsession, and turned one of his palaces into a university. He's directly responsible for whatever schooling these youngsters get. Haile Selassie is a lonely man now. His wife, two sons, a daughter are all dead. To have survived them for the better part of 55 years in power is something unequaled by any ruler in the world today. No wonder the Lion of Judah has become one of the living legends of our time.